Well, today, sinless anger, or how to be mad and still go to heaven. Wouldn't you like to do that? We all like to get mad, it seems like. But you know, I think of a key text that we as Adventist people have preached on in the past in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18. And the nations were what? Angry. The nations were angry, and we are living, friends, in a time of angry nations. We're living in a time of angry people. And maybe you're one of those people, or have been one of those people, one of those people who, at times, your temper has gotten the better of you. Have you ever went beyond the temptation to just simply be upset with someone to the point of blowing up, maybe being mean, and even destructive with someone? Perhaps we have. We want to look at a text in the book of Ephesians today, but before we look at that text, I want to go back and look at some of the background leading up to the text. And I think we can draw some lessons from this that will be very helpful that we can make application today to us, to where we are at, where our nation is at, where our people are at, and where the world is at. That will be helpful to us. And so I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 11, Paul's writing and he says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Paul says that God has given his church certain gifts. And these gifts are to bring us into a unity of the faith, and to a knowledge of what? The Son of God. But we understand that most of the professed world today doesn't even believe there's a Son of God. How could we have the true unity? How could we be the people God wants us to be when we don't even believe there's a Son of God? I doubt that Paul fully was given a prophetic vision of how the truth about God would be stampled upon. But if, if he could have seen where this thing has led to today, I think he would have been so terribly appalled. But he says that God was, I mean, you know, from what Paul is saying here is it's clear that God was fully aware of what was going to happen. And he did not want his people to be tossed to and fro by every what? Wind of doctrine. Every wind of doctrine. And especially doctrine that involved the knowledge of the Son of God, which would help bring us into the unity of the faith that was so necessary. Continuing in verse 15 now. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Verse 18. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Continuing in verse 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And you realize that in Old English, this word conversation many times meant more than just what you spoke, but it concerned your lifestyle. Your lifestyle. And he says, we've put off the former lifestyle. We've put off the things which are corrupt according to deceitful lust. Well, let's see what goes on. Verse 23. And we are to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man. 
Now, in verse 22, he said, you put off the old man. In verse 24, now he says, and you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And so he says here, now God has put spiritual gifts in the church that we might come into the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a stature of a perfect man, that we be not tossed with every wind of doctrine, tossed to and fro. He has placed these gifts in the church so that we could come to perfection through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the believer is to put off the lust and the greed of the past. And He tells us to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Or as Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So when he wants our minds to be renewed, he wants them to be renewed like the mind of Christ. We are to put on the new man, and he says that we become new creatures in Christ, created, created in righteousness and true holiness. And you remember in Psalms chapter 51 and verse 10, David prayed, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David understood that salvation is a creative process. And so he needed a heart. He needed a new heart. Now, we know that Dr. Christian Barnard from South Africa, I believe, was the first person to perform a human heart transplant of a physical heart, right? And that was several years ago. But Jesus, Jesus has been in the process of heart transplants for a long time. He's been giving us new hearts. And friends, that should just tell us how bad our old sinful heart is. Our old sinful heart is so bad, Jesus even can't fix it. He has to just give us a new one. It can't be replaced or fixed. It has to be replaced. And he says here in our text in Ephesians that we are to put away lying. And we are to speak the truth. And in the Greek, this is an imperative. It's the language structure tells us it's an imperative. That means it's not an option. This is something God says, you must do this. You must put away lying and you must speak the truth in love. Well, so good. So far. Or we might say so far, so good. We see Christianity in all of this. It makes sense. But now let's go to verse 26 in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. And so if we are letting the sun go down upon our wrath, the, the structure parallels to that is, is the fact that we are giving place to the devil to work in our lives. But he says something interesting. This is also an imperative in the Greek. It's not an option according to the command. The command says, be ye angry. We would think it should say, don't get angry. But it says, be angry. And that is a very correct translation. And today, all of you should be angry. In fact, it's an imperative again. Yet, yet ironically, it might seem on the surface in just a few verses, Paul says this in verses 31 and 32. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. In verse 26, he says, be ye angry. In verse 31, he says, put this away from you with all malice. How do we make this fit? Well, you know, the first hypothesis that I would come to, and you might come to a different way of looking at this, is that, well, you know, we're, we're talking about what Paul's writing here from a Greek language that's been translated in English. And so maybe the words that they translate anger or angry here are different words that have different meanings. Well, that, that could be possible. 
but it's not the case. For instance, the word that we translate angry here in verse 26 actually comes from a Greek word orgizo. Orgizo. And what we have here in verse 26 is actually the verb present passive imperative second person plural form of orgizo. But it's just simply this word angizo, which means to be angry. It means to be angry. I'll show you a few other places it's used. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 34. Here we have some of the parables of Christ. I'll, I'll give you two of the parables of Christ. And the first is the parable of the unforgiving servant. And in the parable of the unforgiving servant, it says, And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. This word that we translate wroth is from the same word that we translate anger over in uh, Ephesians 4.26. And by the way, who is the one who is wroth in the parable? <laughs> the Lord, it says. Well, in the parable of the marriage of the king's son. In Matthew 22, in verse 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Who does the king represent in this parable? It represents God the Father. Because, you know, he has a son. He's going to get his son married. And this represents the, the joining of Christ in his church. And, and the people didn't like this idea. And so now it says God is wroth. He is angry. We see this in Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was, what? Wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and had the testimony of Jesus Christ. Christ. I saw a picture of a language teacher one time illustrating this word wrath. And what he did, he took a, a, a chair and he picked up the chair and he was like he was holding it over someone like he was ready to slam it on him. He says, now this is what wrath means. Orgizo. Orgizo. It clearly means to be angry or to be greatly upset. Now, back in Ephesians 4 and verse 26. Ephesians 4.26. It says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your what? Wrath. Well, maybe that word wrath is a different word. Well, actually, it sort of is and it isn't. It's perogizmo, which is from para, which is the word for beside, and orgizo. So it's basically the same concept. Wrath, the anger, it's the same. But what about verse 31? What are the words translated here? Well, in verse 31, the word for wrath here is actually a different word. It's thumos, thumos. But it means a state of intense anger with the implication of a passionate outburst. So again, it means something pretty passionate. And the word for anger in verse 31 is orge. Orge, which is actually the root word for orgizo. It's just the root word for orgizo. So it's fundamentally the same word. This seems quite strange. I thought the meek and mild Jesus didn't like us to be angry. But Paul says, be angry. Well, Jesus did say something about this in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22. Matthew 5, 22. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever say to his brother Rekha shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So Jesus is speaking about not being angry, but then he says, but not to be angry without a cause. Doesn't that change it just a little bit? I mean, if you take that expression without a cause out, it reads differently. We'd have to mention that. In other words, Jesus is saying there is an exception. There is an exception. There is an exception where there can be a, as it were, a cause. So if there is a type of condition, we need to understand that condition. And the sooner the better. Because the Bible speaks. Now, first of all, we know God doesn't sin, right? Is that a given? Well, 
get 100% unanimous agreement on it, right? God doesn't sin. But yet, and, and, and secondly, I think we get all agreement on that we're all to become like God in character, right? God wants us to become like him in character. So we, we got a good foundation we all agree upon. So what would I tell you if 32 times the Bible speaks about the anger of the Lord? Because it does. 32 times. Let me give you just a few of them. In Judges 2.14, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. God was angry. In fact, you know, the Hebrew word that we translate anger or angry, it means to have like a, a hot, snorting nose. The, the Hebrew language is a very concrete language. It's not an abstract language. Anything that we consider abstract, things like love, anger, passion, those things have to be described in some kind of a concrete form. And so when they spoke about someone being angry, they said, he has a hot nose. He has a hot nose. That's the way they described anger. And, and not only is the anger of the Lord here, but the anger of the Lord was hot. His hot nose was hot. It's, it's, it's a way of really emphasizing just how upset he was. In Judges chapter 10 and verse 7, here we find the Lord again upset with his people. And the anger of the Lord was hot again against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And then there was a young man one day whose name was Uzzah. Have you ever heard of a young man today named Uzzah? No one names their son Uzzah anymore. Because God had to kill Uzzah. They were trying to transport the sacred ark. And they failed to do it in the prescribed manner. They put it on an ox cart. And somehow this, the oxen stumbled and they must have hit a bump. And it looked like that the ark was going to tip and maybe fall. And Uzzah reached out his hand, seemingly to do a good thing, to touch the ark. And verse 10, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. That's the anger of the Lord. Sounds pretty serious to me. Ten times in the scriptures, we read about an expression called the wrath of God. The wrath of God. In fact, in John chapter 3, that famous chapter where Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In that same chapter, just 20 verses later, we have this verse. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And that word wrath is from that Greek word orge, the wrath of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. For the wrath, the orge of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And I like the way the, I think the New King James translates this. It says, who hold back the truth. Because that's more accurate to the Greek. They hold it back. They, they hold it. They keep others from having the truth. Well, some of us have maybe read Revelation 14.10 recently. Revelation 14.10. Those who receive the mark of the beast, it says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And this wrath is not orge, but it's thumos. It's one of the same words used in Ephesians 4.31. The thumos of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. But Paul tells us, he says, be ye angry. Be angry and sin not. So we know that in whatever anger Paul is speaking about, we are to understand that this means that something that is done without sin, something that is done that is within the character of God. And if God can have wrath and anger and he never sins, then friends, we can have this same kind of wrath and anger and by his rep grace replicate that experience. Now, there's another word I want to consider for just a minute. And it's a word we haven't seen yet in the scriptures, but we will. And it's a word called indignation. Indignation. And fundamentally, indignation is anger 
or annoyance provoked by what is perceived as what? Unfair treatment. Someone's treated unfairly. You see this. You have indignation because someone was treated unfairly. Speaking about the response he wishes God to show to those who have mistreated him, David said this in Psalm 69, 24. He says, pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy, what? Let thy anger take hold of them? Not just only their anger, but let, or God's anger, but let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. That's pretty strong words, isn't it, aren't they? But you know, it would be easier if I didn't have to preach this. I'd just like to preach cupcakes today. Much more pleasant. But you know, we're told to preach the whole word of God, right? Yeah. Well, in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 10. It says, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his what? Right. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. It says God has an indignation. And a good place to see how this works is in the book of Esther. Esther chapter 5 and verse 9. But it says, Then went Haman forth that day, joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the gate, and that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Now let me ask you, was Haman's indignation justified? No, it wasn't justified at all. But it was indignation, because remember, indignation is, is a perceived unfairness. Maybe it's unfair and maybe it's not, but it's something that people perceive as being unfair, and therefore they become indignant about what's happened. And here Haman became indignant toward Mordecai because he thought Mordecai wasn't treating him like he should have. In the Bible, indignation at times seems to be synonymously used with wrath and anger. And I want to give you what I think is the prime example of the Bible. It's found concerning the golden calf experience. As you remember, Moses and Joshua were called up into the mount to receive the Ten Commandments. And, 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 and before they could finish getting all the instruction, God said, you, you need to get haste down to camp. There's problems going on. And so as they started to ascend, Joshua said, I think I hear the sound of war. Moses said, no, it's not the sound of war. You're hearing the sound of singing and dancing and, and, and party going on. Well, in, let's just read the text, though. In Exodus 32, verses 17 through 19. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that do sing, I hear. Verse 19. And it came to pass... As soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. His hot nose got hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. This text says that Moses was angry. In fact, his anger waxed hot, so hot that he cast down and he break the sacred Ten Commandments. And this was so justified that God did not punish Moses. He did not commend Moses, condemn Moses. He did not reprimand Moses in any way for doing this. But may I remind you that we read just a little bit ago about a man who just reached up to try to touch the container of the Ten Commandments to keep it from tipping over. And he was struck dead for even just touching the container of the Ten Commandments. So this indignation of Moses was great, and it was justified. We are told the following in the Review and Herald of September 1, 1896, paragraph 7. And I've broken the paragraph into two parts so that the text can be a little bigger on the screen. As Moses came down from the mountain with the two tables of the testimony in his hand, he heard the shouts of the people. And as he came near, he beheld the idol and the reveling multitude. Overwhelmed with horror and what? Indignation that God had been so dishonored. 
and that the people had broken their solemn covenant with him, he cast the tables of stone upon the ground and broke them. Moses wasn't overwhelmed with feelings like, oh, I didn't do a good enough job. They didn't respect me. He's overwhelmed by the fact that they disregarded God and disrespected God. And then the paragraph continues. Though his love for Israel was so great that he was willing to lay down his own life for the people, his zeal for the glory of God moved him to anger, which found expression in this act of such terrible significance. God did not rebuke him. The breaking of the tables of stone was but a representation of the fact that Israel had broken the covenant which they had recently made with God. His anger, get this, his anger was not prompted by self-love or wounded ambition, but was that righteous indignation against sin which springs from zeal for the glory of God and which is referred to in the words of Scripture, be ye angry and sin not. There's our text. You see, there's a righteous indignation, an anger over the sin, an anger over the dishonoring of God that we can be mighty upset about. And that's not wrong. And in fact, we should be upset about it. It says that Moses' anger was not prompted by self-love or ambition. And these are things, friends, that so often we become angry about or we have indignation about that are wrong. And that's what's wrong. It's when it's about me and about self and not about God. In another place, we read this from Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 25. Manuscript date of 1914, paragraph 25. She asks the question, can there be anger without sin? Yes, there is a holy indignation at the total depravity of the human heart. And all that that human heart does, there's a total depravity for it. In Spirit of Prophecy, volume 2, page 219.3, there is an anger that is not of this criminal nature, a certain kind of indignation is justifiable under some circumstances, even in the followers of Christ. When they see God dishonored, his name reviled, and the precious cause of truth brought into disrepute by those who profess to revere it, when they see the innocent oppressed and persecuted, a righteous indignation stirs their soul. Such anger, born of sensitive morals, is not a sin. I think of probably what Elder M. L. Andreessen must have thought when he first read the book, Questions on Doctrine. He saw the precious cause of truth brought into disrepute by those who professed to revere it. And it didn't settle well with him. It didn't settle well with him at all. And friends, it shouldn't settle well with you when you see it either. Now, yes, there are times that we are to be angry and sin not. But friends, we have to, we have to realize that there, there are times that restraint must be used. Because we will be so easy with our human natures to just um, fly off into anger at anything and everything without a proper excuse. It can happen. In Desire of Ages, on page 553, paragraph 2, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now this is going back to, the, to, to when he's going to raise Lazarus, okay? And here he is, he's weeping with Mary and Martha and so on. But it says, He read the hearts of all assembled. He saw that with many... What passed as a demonstration of grief was only pretense. He knew that some in the company, now manifesting hypocritical sorrow, would ere long be planning the death, not only of the mighty miracle worker, but of the one to be raised from the dead. Christ could have stripped from them their robe of pretended sorrow, but he restrained his righteous indignation. 
He had that righteous indignation, but he restrained it. The words he could in all truth have spoken, he did not speak because of the loved one kneeling at his feet in sorrow who truly believed in him. He had to be careful. He had to work in a way that wouldn't hurt someone else, wouldn't turn someone else off, wouldn't give the wrong impression to those who wouldn't understand. Sometimes we have to be careful and restrain righteous indignation. But in this anger of righteousness or righteous indignation, we again are not to sin. But when the anger is from self-love or wounded ambition, it becomes wrong. It becomes wrong. We can think that we are zealous for God and Christ and that we can be loud, mean-spirited to others and denounce the sins of others when in reality we are more angry against the people than we are their sin. We are more zealous for our statute and honor than for the Lord of hosts. And friends, we can be deceived about this. Make no question about that. In Acts of the Apostles, on page 78 in paragraph 3, the leaders in the Jewish nation had signally failed of fulfilling God's purpose for His chosen people. Those whom the Lord had made the depositories of truth had proved unfaithful to their trust. And God chose others to do His work. In their blindness, these leaders now gave full sway to what they called righteous indignation against the ones who were setting aside their cherished doctrines. So when they had the apostles put in prison, had them beaten, we are simply expressing our righteous indignation. How dare these men speak against our holy church? Why, this church was founded by God. God named this church. How dare they speak against it? Righteous indignation. In Desire of Ages on page 310 in paragraph 4, it is true there is an indignation that is justifiable, even in the followers of Christ, when they see that God is dishonored and his service brought into disrepute, when they see the innocent oppressed, a righteous indignation stirs in the soul. Such anger, born of sensitive morals, is not a sin. But those who at any supposed provocation feel liberty to indulge anger or resentment are opening the heart to who? Satan. Satan. He says, be ye angry and sin not, and he says, don't give way to the devil. See? And here she's saying that in just different words. She says, bitterness and animosity must be banished from the soul if we would be what? In harmony with heaven. Do you want to be in harmony with heaven? I want to be in harmony. I mean, I'll be like John Glenn when they said, who wants are those, you know, Mercury 7, who wants to go first? And they all raised their hand. John Glenn put up two hands. He, he wanted to go first. He went second, or third, I guess, or whatever it was. But uh, first man to do the orbit of America. Let's talk about some application of this. Our country has been rocked the last two and a half weeks with the issues of social injustice toward people. Police brutality cannot be denied in certain incidences. Whereas I think most reasonable people would, would, would understand that in most cases, the police really work hard to do a good job. There clearly have been many issues of police brutality. This has instigated uh, certain protests, and some of these protests have also ended up, or in extension to the protests, there has been rioting and looting. You have two wrongs, and two wrongs never make a right. Either one of these can arouse anger in the other of righteous indignation, because it is unfair treatment. It is wrong what has happened. But we'll be like that with you. It will depend upon your motives, but neither justifies the others. Again, two wrongs don't make a right. And in fact, hostilities against evildoers only alienate them further from a righteous cause. You think about that. When the police are showing brutality, if, if there are white policemen and they're showing brutality to, 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 to someone from the black community, does that make the black community love the white police more? 
No, I mean, it, it just drives them further away from wanting anything to do with the white police. On the other hand, when some of the white folk see black folks rioting and looting the street, tearing up property, you know, and, and doing those kind of things, does it endear them to the black community? It doesn't. I know that. I, I, I talked to people this week about some of this. And, and, and I was surprised by some of the things that I heard people say that I didn't think they would say certain things. It's true, friends, that these things are wrong. And when our black brothers or sisters are abused by police, it makes the black community more untrusting of the civil authorities. And the converse is true, that when there's rioting and looting by the blacks against whites, then the whites become more prejudiced. Returning evil with evil never works. But what we are, we're not concerned about the glory of God. We're not so concerned about anything except ourselves. And that's where we get into trouble, a lot of trouble. God has taught us to love one another. And Jesus has taught us in the story of the Good Samaritan that whosoever is in need is our brother. And so if there's a person, regardless of his color, nationality, or race, or creed, or anything else, and he's being abused by the police, or any other semblance of authority, I have a responsibility to try to come to his aid. I do. And if there is someone whose home, livelihood, their, their, their way of life is being destroyed by people who are rioting and looting and just, just doing havoc, I have a responsibility to stand for that person too because they are both my brother. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus is the head of this brotherhood of not white people, of not black people, not red or yellow people. He is the head of the humanity of people, the humanity of man itself and mankind. This spirit of retaliation, friends, it must stop. You know, people are out protesting, and, and you know, and I've said before, and I'll say it again, that there's nothing more American and peacefully protesting, exercising our First Amendment rights to say what's on our mind. And, and, and it's my responsibility to respect you to be able to do that, even if I disagree with you. I might agree with you, I might disagree with you, but it's my responsibility to respect you and, and to give you that right to do that. But this retaliation that is not civil it must stop. And so there's people protesting, and they're trying to bring about change. Well, well, what's the change that's needed? The change that's needed is, first of all, to stop the retaliations from all perspectives. And then we must join hands in the love of God. In the love of God. And we are not to hate people. We are to hate evil. We are to be angry at evil and what evil does. But the spirit of retaliation must stop. We can be angry at the actions of the police who murder people, yes, but not at the police. We can be angry at the actions of those who would destroy and steal, but we are to love the sinner and hate the sin. In Desire of Ages also, on page 310, in paragraph 3, we are told that the Jews cultivated a spirit of retaliation. In their hatred of the Romans, they gave utterance to hard denunciations and pleased the wicked one by manifesting his attributes. Let me just pause. Do you think that the Romans were treating those Jewish people fairly? Of course not. Of course not. And, and, and so they were, there were people here and they said, you know, we have indignation because we're being treated unfairly. But instead of dealing at the heart of the issue, instead of dealing with the heart of the issue, they went to the people in the issue. And that's where they made their mistake. She says they gave utterance to hard denunciations and pleased the wicked one by manifesting his attributes. Thus, they were training themselves to do the terrible deeds to which he led them on. In the religious life of the Pharisees, there was nothing to recommend piety to the Gentiles. 
Jesus bade them not to deceive themselves with the thought that they could in heart rise up against their oppressors and cherish the longing of a, to avenge their wrongs. Friends, we can't do that either. I don't care who, who I am, where I'm from, what my background is. When people do me wrong, you know. It's been a few years back. But some of you may or may not know that I used to be a, a minister in the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church. And this was my life. God had given me a call to the ministry. And there was nothing more important to me than this call in the ministry. And the church took that call, as it were, so seemingly from me. They created a situation that I, I got in financial destitution, which is a long story, but that was part of the thing. And, you know, and, and I had every reason to be upset with individuals. But I had seen before where people had done this. People had been upset. There had been a particular minister, I mentioned his name last night when I was talking with you all, um, from California one time, who was dismissed from the, from the ministry. And his wife was so upset, they had a little travel trailer. And she took it down to the church, uh, local church, and parked it on the church lawn and pulled the plug for the gray water. You know, didn't help anyone. Didn't help anyone. You know, we can't do stuff like that. We can't, hold, we can't harbor ill will because we'll go to hell and we'll be lost and we'll lead others there with us. And that's not what we want, is it? We want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven mad, but I want to go to heaven mad the right way, you see. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's, an, there's another area of this righteous indignation that we should apply to, and we spoke to it a little bit, but that's about false teachers among God's people. And this righteous indignation where evil leaders are teaching false doctrines to people, even to little ones. I, I have a dear brother who is, who is just, he's so close to me, he's part of my flesh. And he's going through a terrible situation with his family now. His wife has left him because of the truth. And, and they have this beautiful young daughter And the wife is still not divorced, although actively seeking a divorce. But she's living with a man. And they're teaching this daughter, who they have custody of most of the time, they're teaching the daughter that the new daddy, the new guy in the house, is her true daddy. Her true daddy. And don't pray. And don't, when you go to your, when you're, when you go to your dad's house, that other guy, don't make him let you, don't make him pray. Don't make, I'm sorry, don't make... Don't let him make you pray. You know, I can get indignation over that. And I don't even know this guy. I've never met him. But I can just imagine if I was a father, I'd want to be in someone's face. And not in too long a time either. Because you're taking one of these little ones that Jesus said in Matthew 18, 6. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. And that word offend there is, is from the Greek word skandalezo. It means to put a snare in the way, hence to cause to stumble or to give offense. But yet that other man is someone Jesus has died for. It's someone that Jesus Christ considers his blood to be so precious that he died for him. And I must do that too. But I can sure hate what has happened. I can be indignant about what's happened. But I have to do it in such a way that I can still love the sinner. And still go forward. We should have righteous indignation, friends, when preachers dare to tell us not to examine certain biblical doctrines like don't go down that road and they try to persuade us to believe lies that will condemn us, condemn us to hell, condemn our children to hell and they will tell us that we should pay 
the corporation, to pay the preachers to teach us how to go to hell. I have indignation about that. I do. Now, some of you may not like this sermon. Some of you may think I've spoken a little too, too brisk today. But I want to tell you the devil didn't like it either. I promise you that. Friends, we need to be willing to stand up for the truth, the whole truth, all the truth. But we cannot allow our passions, our passions, our feelings to sway us from one extreme position to another. We may have this position that, you know, Jesus is just, you know, he's unicorn and rainbows, right? He's cupcakes. <laughs> he's nice. And then we end up going to another extreme where everything is anger and everything is indignation. We can't do that either. But there is a place where we can be angry, Paul says, and sin not. And God wants his people to be angry and sin not, but yet at the same time to put away anger and wrath. The anger and the wrath that we're to put away is that which comes from self-love and our own ambition. And we are to hold on to the indignation that comes from having a zeal for the Lord of hosts. Even to the point, if we could break the sacred Ten Commandments of God, that God would not hold us guilty. Can you imagine that? That's a sacredness that we need to have, friends, that God's calling us to have. And I want you to have it. And I want to have it. But friends, the only way we can have it is if we, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, is to put off what? What did he say is put off? Put off the old man and his ways. And then we have to put on the new man in Christ. If we, don't, if we don't experience a true conversion, friends, we'll never be able to live the holy, sacred life that God wants us to live right now. But if we put on the new man, then we'll be able to obey the commands of God. You know, there's, there's a lot of commands besides simply the Ten Commandments. I understand everything fundamentally flows underneath that. You know, but we can be, for instance, we can be so righteous about keeping the Sabbath sundown to sundown, and that's good. We should zealously guard the edges of the Sabbath, we're told, right? We can be so zealous about every particle of food that goes in our mouth to the point that we can strain at the gnat and swallow the camel. We can do many of these things, but then when Jesus says, go ye out into all the world and preach the gospel, we say, well, um, that's for the preacher to do. <laughs> you know, someone else can do that. Or when he says, be ye angry and sin not, well, that's for someone else to take up that, that cause. That's, that's for the John the Baptist that are in the group. That's for the Elijahs in the group. But friends, we all carry what? The Elijah message. message. Exactly. Every one of us. And if we don't carry the Elijah message, friends, we're not going to heaven. It's just that simple. It's that clear. So may God bless us each to make that consecration, to give our hold to Christ so that we can be the people he wants us to be, living the way he wants us to live, doing the things he wants us to do, because we're here at the end of time. And we don't have a lot more time to, to, to get things fixed. Jesus didn't say, go get ready. He said, be you ready. For such hours you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And may God bless each one of you, friends. Lots and lots and lots.